Juan, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me, Jonas. It's been a minute, and uh, you and I go go way back, man. So it's a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor. Likewise, likewise. It's fun to turn the tables. I've I've appeared on your podcast more than once. I think I was one of the very first interviews that you did a couple of years ago. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a pleasure to have you on. I mean, over the past couple of years of 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 doing your podcast, interviewed you know hundreds of of people on on all types of of different topics from you know consciousness, spirituality, the esoteric, the supernatural. I'm curious, uh, just what initially got you interested in in all this research and these these fields of of, of discussion. What did it for me was growing up in a religious household, I was shielded from a lot of the extracurricular stories that now I know of, but I was told it all started with the book of Enoch. And uh, one time I questioned, hey, why is the book of Enoch, why is a non-canonical book referenced in the canon? What's all that about? And they pretty much straight up told me, well, you know, you can kind of disregard the Old Testament altogether, and you can also disregard the book of Enoch, and actually, if you read it, you're going to get demonically possessed. And I said, wait a minute, what? So, <laughs> when you tell, you know, when you tell hmm. a kid not to do something, they're going to do it. And as they say, curiosity killed the cat. So, for me, <laughs> it started with that, and once I realized that all the stories, because I grew up Pentecostal, all the stories that I was ever told, there's the complete opposite of those same stories in a different book. I started to question, well, how do we know that ours is the right one? And once you dive into Gnosticism, you're going to bump up with alchemy. You're going to bump up with, with, with the occult. You're going to bump up with, in general, esoteric topics, which esoteric is just specialized knowledge is all it is but then you get into the realm of secret societies using this esoteric knowledge and these principles for what some would call global domination or or <laughs> wanting to rule the world or you have the illuminati and you have all these other groups so it started with me with religion and once i opened up the wormhole of the rabbit hole of gnosticism i i just it, it opened up a whole another can of worms, man. And I've been there ever since. And I'll be honest with you. I don't think I understand it any better than I did five years ago. I interviewed you mm. about five or six years ago. Now I started in 2019 and it's been, a, it's been a little bit and I don't understand these topics any more than when I was first introduced to them. So there's something to be said mm -hmm. there. The more I learn, the less I know. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I feel the same way in a, in a lot of ways. The more, the more you know, the less you know. It's, it's so true when it comes to all these different areas of of discussion. I mean, so you kind of encountered the Book of Enoch, right? And that and that 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 triggered some sort of fascination. When you say they didn't tell you, they told you not to read this. Even was that your parents? Was that family? Uh, uh, kind of fa family. family and friends, church, you know, people in the church. Like I was curious, like, Hey, I'm starting a podcast. I want to learn about this, but they're like, no, 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 no. What do you, what do you do? Are you crazy? You know? And I'm like, wait a minute, we're in 20, whatever. We're, we're still thinking that superstitiously where you can read this, this information and, and become possessed by it open, which I'm sure in your line of work, you've encountered, these sort of topics, then you find out there was psychedelics in the Bible and the use of uh, mind altering substances. And then, I mean, you're, you're here, Jonas, you know, you've been trying to figure out what consciousness is forever. I mean, that's what I made me stumble across your channel and we don't even understand consciousness yet. We're going to understand what God is, what this incorporeal infinite power is. We've all, we've already got it down. We've got it down packed. Yeah. I don't know. It's in this book and this is it. And this is it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not here to disprove any religion. I'm not here to tell you that your religion is bad. No, I'm simply here to answer questions for myself. And it's always been about myself. And I bring people along on those conversations. And we have open-minded conversations to where you're able to question these things because I've been there of, hey, don't read that because you're going to 
X, Y, Z. And I go, wait a minute, this is the way that they were thinking in the 16th century, right? <laughs> Queen Elizabeth and John D and all these, they were thinking the same exact way. And it's been all about knowledge since the beginning, Jonas. It was in the Garden of Eden. He said, hey, you can eat from all these other trees, except for that one right there. And when they did, they became like one of us. Well, who's us? Mm. <laughs> you know, like, who's us? And, and what did they learn that they became like one of you? So I've been here ever since. And it's been it's been a ride, but I enjoy I, I've always been a history buff. I, I've always enjoyed mythology, ancient history and sprinkling a little bit of conspiracy in there with everything else, just how everything is. And I'm having fun, Jonas. But but yeah, I, I agree with you. We don't, we don't understand the consciousness, but yet we we're going to grasp what God is and what this infinite power is that people have been trying to come up with answers for thousands of years since the beginning of time people have been questioning their reality what what is your perspective on on consciousness is it just kind of an emergent phenomenon produced by the complex interaction of neurons in the brain is there more to consciousness than the physical cogito ergo sum right Rene descartes is one of my favorite philosophers and right, the mind body dualism problem that we've all faced, even Descartes talked about there being an evil demon controlling reality. And the reason I enjoyed Gnosticism so much is because they they answered some questions that I've had about consciousness and they understood that thinking came first, thought came first. And then, uh, you know, a, a, a thought thinking of itself thinking created the feminine and then they created the Christos, the child. So. Uh, they answered that for me, but I do believe that what consciousness is, I believe that it's not, it's non-local. So I do believe it's the original cloud, if you will. And I think that in my studies of the occult and the esoteric, I think it's something that's tapped into, right? And the reason I say that is because, for example, the current of, of magic with a K, it's like the story of Star Wars, right? It's this thing. It's the force. It exists. It's always existed. And in Star Wars, you know, certain people can tap into it, but I believe everyone can tap into it. And depending on how you use it determines the outcome. We know the Sith use it for evil and we know the Jedi use it for good. But nonetheless, it still exists. And that, to me, I believe that we are receivers of consciousness. We're receivers of this essence, everyone. And that's what, you know, to the Stoics, the Logos became this thing. And to the Christians, the Logos, you have a more intimate relationship with it. For the Stoics, they believed, well, it's just a circle of life. It's just this thing that exists Right. And it's just here and it's why things happen. And I don't know. I've always battled between back and forth of like, is consciousness, could, could that be God? Could that be God animating us? Right. And then you get into the whole concept of alchemy, which kind of sort of, you know, the whole aspect of alchemy is animating in an inanimate matter by manipulating said matter in a certain type of way to mm. bring forth this change, right? Bring forth the, the magnum opus. And, and I believe that all of creation, and this is why the, the alchemists, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with the alchemists because they did entire, uh, I'm in, I'm currently translating a 1200 page lecture uh, from the, from the 15th century on, it was a, these alchemists, they were doing commentaries on the book of Genesis. They believe that Genesis was the book that revealed the secrets of how to create what Carl Jung called an Unus Mundus and an Unus Mundus, you know, a miniature world. And they believe that the book of Genesis revealed this secret that this, the book of Genesis has the secrets, how to create the magnum opus. But all that has been washed away by what they present to us now. Okay, so they don't teach mm. us that in Sunday school of like, hey, you know, all these 16th century alchemists were obsessed with the book of e with the book of, of Gen and the book of Enoch too. Some of the first alchemists were talking about the book of Enoch, 
And if you hmm. trace back the origins of alchemy, it goes back to the Nephilim, these incorporeal spirits that came down and did stuff with the daughters of men. And they passed down this esoteric and occult knowledge to them. So, yeah, I, I've I've battled with the with the question of what what is consciousness, or, or even better, yeah, what is reality, Jonas? I mean, is consciousness reality? Is reality consciousness? Is God conscious? What is this, right? Like, what is all this, and where did it come from? And it's the ultimate, in my opinion, thought experiment. There's a whole lot there. <laughs> I have like 20 questions I want to ask you right now. Real quick, you're you're translating a a 1,200-page volume. We of, have the technology, uh, the, yes. Uh, fr fr from the book of Genesis? From, from what language into what language? From German. So I hired a German professor uh, on Fiverr. And I took, so we have the technology now, Jonas, to take entire books and OCR them, scan the pages, pull the text. So I pulled the pages, I pulled the text from the pages. I had a professional uh, uh, German speaking, he, he specialized in 15th century German, 16th century German, and he fixed all the errors for me that the AI had not picked up. He did about, about 100 pages for me. I trained an algorithm to read the, the pages and now I'm in the process of using chat GPT to take it from this 16th century, 15th century German to English as best as it possibly can. Now it's not going to be perfect, but we have something that we can work with. This knowledge has been locked away for hundreds of years. I might be the last person in or the first person in probably 400, 500 years to, to read this text that I'm translating. Fascinating. What are you, what are you, what, what are you hoping? I mean, you touched on this already, but what are you hoping to learn from that? I want to see what the perspective of, of, you know, the esoteric Christianity, what the, cause it's got to do with the Rosicrucians and I want to learn, I want to get inside the heads of these alchemists, what they were thinking, how they were thinking, and maybe come to a conclusion myself. I might, I'm probably not going to find the answers because that's just the way that this sort of information works. It is occult information. Only the people initiated in said secrets are able to even understand what's being presented because to the uninitiated, this text may read completely different than to the initiate. So I'm just curious. But again, mm -hmm. curiosity killed the cat, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> you, you've you've mentioned a number of different topics that I, I I find really really interesting. I mean, from from Gnosticism to alchemy, even the Nephilim, right? Consciousness is potentially fundamental, and in that sense, how does it relate to God or divinity or or the infinite? If consciousness is fundamental, would you would you Kind of compare that to the idea of the soul or, or or spirit. What are your thoughts on soul or spirit? I would, Do we have a soul? Yeah, I would. I would. That and that's the the question that I battle with a lot. Is it is it the same thing? Is it different aspects of the same thing? Right. And I I believe that's what religion is also. I I believe that we all have the pieces of the puzzle. We're just looking. We. It's like the 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 allegory of everyone's in a dark room touching the, the, the elephant. This dude's touching the trunk. This other guy's touching the foot. This guy's touching the, the, the tail. Oh, this is an elephant. This is it. It's like, no, well, you're wrong because it feels this way. It's like, no, you're touching the same thing. You just got to step back and illuminate, <laughs> right? Become enlightened. Illuminate the way for you to understand the whole picture. And I do think that I, I would say consciousness soul the essence all the all the things that these guys were talking about which the soul is or the divine spark to to relate it to gnostic terms is that same thing and it was all about understanding how to transcend to that next level to become one with the source right because 
Gnostics were emanationists. And what that means is that they believe that all of observable reality that we're seeing now was just an emanation from the source. This plays into what Plato was talking about with the theory of forms that there is. And, and, and again, the Platonist, the Neoplatonist, all these guys were talking about a more mm. divine, a more perfect reality than our own. Right. As above, so below. My problem with that, Jonas, is that that demeans our reality. That that makes people get into get nihilistic point of view. And that's what Nietzsche was trying to talk about. Like, hey, we killed God. He wasn't celebrating the death of God. He's like, you know, God is dead and we killed him. And that leads you to a path of nihilism. And ultimately, the most dangerous thing, which would be, you know, you've got nothing to lose. And nothing is more dangerous than a man that has nothing to lose. Right? So... Mm-hmm. This gets into more of a philosophical uh, sort of thing where it's like, what is the purpose then? Right? right. If I'm talking to you about the Gnostics, well, their purpose was to acquire the Gnosis. And Gnosis is an open ended term. Well, what is Gnosis? Well, Gnosis was that sacred knowledge that it's sacred to you. Okay, it's whatever, and maybe that's what I'm seeking, Jonas. Maybe that's what I'm looking for in all these ancient texts. That one piece of that one, how William Burroughs says, there's always a string of words that will completely destroy you, obliterate you. Mm-hmm. Does that mean I'll dissolve out of reality? I'll dissolve out of existence when I once I learn the the who actually shot JFK. Once I learn that piece of information, will I just fizzle out of existence? Right, and and, and that's what some people say of the, the magnum opus is. Once these alchemists learned what the magnum opus, well, conveniently, they're not around anymore, so they can't tell us what it was because they stepped outside of space and time. That's the, that's the secret to to alchemy. You're able to step mm. outside of space and time and control reality from the outside. Do you become God once you do that? Do you become a, a, a different facet of the source of whatever consciousness is, like whatever that is? I, you know, there's so many questions. I got more questions than answers, Jonas, and that's what I battle with. And this is why I love this sort of of topic because it's like, yeah. It, it, again, back to the original question, I would say that the soul, consciousness, essence, the divine spark, all that other stuff has a central thing, which is all about consciousness. And I do think it's fundamental. And I believe that we all experience consciousness in a different way, if that makes any sense. I think we're all, hey, it might be God experiencing reality from different perspectives. Right. I think so. I mean, it's it, it it really is just endlessly interesting to 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 you know consider and ponder. You you mentioned Gnosticism a few times. My understanding is that Gnosticism is kind of like a a mystical sect of of Christianity that was really oriented towards like a direct experience, like an experiential encounter with divinity, a direct and a direct knowing of exactly what you were just saying that. Consciousness or soul is an emanation of God. And from that point, there is this kind of alchemical process or, or process of, of transcendence, of, of liberation. How would you say that learning about Gnosticism has kind of impacted your life as, as a human Juan? I, I think that, and mind you, there were, I think last I counted, don't call me on this like over 80 different sects of of gnostics there was valentinians uh, and all different sorts of gnostics just to, the same way that there was different paths of alchemy you have the wet path dry path paracelsian valentinian you have different sects of right because it, again it's all about unlocking and tapping into that thing whatever that thing is and it there's multiple ways it's going to count well there's multiple ways to transcend in my opinion Gnosticism has been at the core of all of my work. It was what I first dove into. And I would suggest that you check out Lawrence Caruana, which he was also one of my first one of my first interviews and really the person that broke down Gnosticism so beautifully for me. He's got a great lecture on Gnosticism on YouTube. 
that I've probably listened to, Jonas, probably, I'm not, I'm not lying, over 10 times. And I believe it's a two to three hour presentation because every time I listen to it, I just draw out something new about the Gnostics. And it's really, truly fascinating, but you're absolutely correct. They were the first Christians. And just like everything else, I've learned that throughout history, all the people, and let me phrase this correctly, uh, not to sound weird, but usually, it, well, interpret it however you want. Usually all the people in history that have told some sort of truth have been killed off. The Gnostics being one of those. Now you get into guys like, you know, Philip K. Dick, who talk about the Gnostics. And he adds a different twist to it that is absolutely amazing. That it gets into the idea of, right, the Nag Hammadi or the Dead Sea Scrolls being some sort of informational contagion, right? And that the Gnostics were actually in touch with this piece of information that for lack of a better term, infected them. And, and and the information, you know, informational entities, informational parasites, they will use you until you're gone. So you think about a concept of like a martyr. I call them mimetic martyrs because they die for information. And they're only remembered for what they died for. They're not really remembered what uh, all the information that they contributed. You know, a Giordano Bruno, you don't... You, He's got an, a whole different, you know, set of, of ideas and concepts that he introduced, but you only remember him for what he died for, right? And guess what? He was he was right the whole time, right? Like, so the Gnostics have shaped my views on, on reality, on consciousness, because they understood it from the beginning. They're like the one, the source, and the upper eons, this, this watery light, this other dimension was thought. And I go, damn, that's that's consciousness. And then from there, boom, it just emanates outward. And what we're experiencing now is the lower eons. Now, the Gnostics, again, this is heretical for some, but they believe that Yal the Baoth, the the Satan or Lucifer archetype, created reality. And that to some people rubs them the wrong way, obviously, right? Um, they also believe that the old testament was a work of demons. <laughs> was a work of a demonic entity. They saw Yahweh as a sort of, of, of demon. So you can see how it can get heretical really quickly for some people, and it's a hard pill to swallow. But if you're able to look past that, there's so much more. But so many people are so locked away from that, right? That they don't they don't see past their reality tunnel, right? To use a Robert Anton Wilson uh yeah concept they're they're so stuck in that way of thinking that they're not able to really expand their mind it's all about and i reserve my rights uh, you know i reserve my own ideology and cosmology i do believe in jesus christ i do believe in god i do believe that right i've accepted jesus christ in my life long time ago and i do reserve those rights but i'm a scholar you know i'm a researcher and these are just the places that i go in a, in the most respectful and fun way possible while keeping my ideas right kind of sort of not shielded but uh, it's it's hasn't i've been able to keep that separately from all the stuff that i've studied right uh, but i do believe that there is a source and there's ways of that source to come through and uh, I've, I've gotten accused before of being too gnostic i've been on more christian shows and i've talked about alchemy and the alchemical interpretation of the bible and i go you know what i think the bible is the most magical book the, the most it's, it's a grimoire right you have the rosicrucians using the book of john to do what to go into the text they they meditate on the first verses of john you go what these are esoteric and occult groups using the bible Right. And the word became flesh. Like, What are you talking about? <laughs> and they go into the text and they've confirmed these biblical figures on the other side by meditating on this text and using the text as a mandala to go into this other realm. It's powerful stuff, man. Very powerful. Yeah, I can I can I can sense that. Earlier, you were describing, you know, kind of th th this quest for knowledge. You know, this idea of uncovering a piece of information, or that that facilitates this this transcendence. 
dissolving into something into something greater like that gnostic quest for that direct experience of revelation as you said that you know i i i it immediately brought to mind psychedelics for me because that that's that's i think at the time i didn't even know this but that quest for an experience of the transcendent a direct a direct experience was what kind of magnetically drew me to that exploration i'm wondering have, have you had for yourself an experience that you would characterize as supernatural or or paranormal or transcendental like a a a, a direct uh taste or encounter of that in in your own life yeah, so I've experienced a couple of things. I, I have seen a UFO. I wasn't alone. I was with my family. My entire family saw it. And it was a UFO in the sense of it was it was a, a orange orb flying above my house. And my wife saw it, which wow. she is not anywhere. And she doesn't care about any of this stuff. She's so as far connect disconnected from this sort of stuff. So with her being there, my son was also he was four or five at the time he saw it and it wasn't a drone it wasn't it wasn't an airplane it was something no sound going over the 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 house and it was interesting because i was outside in the porch we had just gotten the pavers done so we're hanging out and i'm smoking a cigar hanging out with the family outside and I'm thinking about a an interview that I was going to do the next day with Mike. Uh, hopefully I say his name, McCullen. I think that's his last name, Mike. I'm sorry, Mike, if I got your name wrong. He, he does the the owl. He does. He talks about the owls and the aliens. I'm sure you've seen his work uh, somewhere. But uh, Mike McClellan, I'm sorry. McClellan, McClellan, I'm sorry. And I was thinking about that. And he's the guy that talks about owls and how they might be ETs presenting themselves as owls, right? Because you have the owl at the Bohemian Grove, you have owls and abduction experiences, and you know people seeing the four-foot owls and all that. So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about alien UFOs. And I'd never seen one before, or one that I understood to be one. Until that day, I look up, you know, my son saw it first, like, what's that? And I look, we looked up, bro, it was a, a orange, was like almost, it looked like a jellyfish. It was like a transparent wow. and it was an or you know orange and as far as a paranormal i i wait, wait can i stop you right there mm -hmm. <laughs> i gotta hear more about this man w w th this 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 was in 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 florida at the time where you were living is that correct yeah florida i'm in florida i'm in Central florida I mean, the synchronicity of that is is pretty remarkable. Like, right as you're kind of contemplating this this conversation that you're going to have, yeah. there, 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 there it goes. What what was that experience like for you on a on a kind of an emotional level? I'll be honest with you, Jonas. I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was again another synchronicity. It it didn't affect me any sort of way. I go, oh, well, that's cool because I'm a skeptic more than anything. And this is part of why I also study all these sort of things. And I've heard multiple. So I have friends with paranormal podcast and, you know, people that talk to them about the dogmen and aliens and the Mothman and ultra terrestrials and all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it always comes down to, well, you know, I have friends who hunt Bigfoot, skunk ape in the Florida Everglades. So did you get it on video? No. Well, you know, I, it, uh, the batteries died or whatever it was. Okay. You know, it always goes down to that. The first thing that a child asks you, my son being one of them who, you know, he believes in Bigfoot, right? He's a kid, right? He's six years old. But the first thing he always asks me whenever we're watching a Bigfoot documentary, are they going to show it on video? So if a child, if the first fundamental question a child asks you because seeing is believing, right? Is are they going to show the dog man? You know, there's a dog man document. Are they going to show him on video? And I just keep, I, you know, I keep them waiting. I go, yeah, you just keep watching. It never shows because, again, it's something. But then once I started learning about the occult and all the same things that these people are describing and their experiences, because it gets into phenomenology where it's almost like a gnosis like experience because phenomenology is 
the experience was real to you. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If you feel that you saw, you know, a Cthulhu walking down the street at three in the morning, hell, then you saw Cthulhu walking down the street. Nobody can take that experience from you. So it's almost like a gnosis like thing where it's like, well, the gnosis is whatever sacred information or experience is to you. It's unique. So almost like right. if consciousness itself has keys to unlock itself individualistically. Right. And I and that's why I say that I think everyone experiences consciousness a different sort of way and whatever is, yep. is special to me. But, you know, this experience didn't really do a lot for me. Uh, and I've, you know, being in the church, I played guitar for many years in the church. I, I've seen miracles. I've seen the Holy Spirit at work. I know that the Holy Spirit is something. What is it? I can't tell you what it is, but I've seen it at work. I've seen people be healed in front of me. Now, if it was fake or not, I can't tell you. But from what I saw, it seemed real as hell. Because when you're in worship, which is all about the manipulation of subtle energies, you know, churches are built a certain type of way. Temples are built a certain type of way because it's about energy. But once you start to call forth certain types of energies, in my opinion, they show. And mm. I've seen that firsthand. You know, so as far as paranormal instances that, you know, I've had the UFO experience, which I haven't seen one since this was probably a year ago now. And in that, and it can be confirmed with my wife, who has nothing to do. She doesn't believe in Bigfoot, doesn't believe in anything else. So for her to see it and acknowledge it, and it wasn't a balloon flying away, it was an orb, and it was moving at a steady pace forward. I recorded my son's reaction right after it. Because it happened so quick, it was probably about 30 seconds, 20, 30 seconds from the time we saw it. Questioning, what the hell is that? And it was gone. How, how did how did how did he react? Oh, he, he he. I have it on video somewhere. He was. I'll send it to you on WhatsApp. He was jumping. Around. He's like, oh, I saw the orb and it was moving and that. You know, a kid. So it's sorry. Go ahead. Mike speculated that because I told him about that the experience. He speculated that uh, you know, me thinking about it, and we you know, there's people who talked about who who have talked about the concept of you bringing forth UFOs, you know, you have the, what's the CE five, CE five, Stephen Greer, Stephen Greer doing these rituals to bring forth these UFOs. I have people who have told me about experiences who have, uh, I have a buddy of mine who's actually working on a documentary right now where they went to a, a cave. I believe it was somewhere up in Tennessee where they had seen uh, some entities coming out of these caves and the guy who, who went with them was a local who practiced uh, CE five. And as they were there, he got into deep meditation and he called forth what they call, you know, lights in the woods. And as soon as he started doing his whole breathing and meditation, he, you know, they had a team in the cave and they had the other team outside. And as soon as the team outside, uh, before they started telling over the radio, like, hey, we're seeing some activity out here. The guy goes, and they're here. <laughs> and then boom, all hell broke loose. And they're seeing these orbs and lights in the sky. I have friends of mine who own a property at Skinwalker Ranch. Mm. And the lights on the mesas, you know, all, all these. Again, what is it? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> So j just to define CE five real quick for anyone who's who might not who's listening who might not be familiar with that terminology, it's it's close encounters of the fifth kind, which is uh, a, a protocol that was developed by a man named Stephen Greer to kind of essentially initiate human initiated contact with non human intelligence, and it's it's pretty far out there, but also um, really fascinating. Groups of people will come together and and meditate. And try to connect with some sort of non-human or otherworldly intelligence that m can manifest as balls of light or, you know, UFOs or energy. a whole host of, of, yeah, energy, a whole host of, of phenomena. The, the UFO rabbit hole is so fascinating, goes so deep because it does seem, I mean, as evidenced by CE5, it does seem to connect with consciousness or with the metaphysical or even with how you're describing the holy spirit 
would you mind sharing a little bit about what, what's your perspective on UFOs, Juan? What, what's 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 your take? How how do you make sense of this phenomena of you this phenomenon of UFOs? So, I've seen. I, I grew up reading about the Bermuda Triangle being in Florida, right, and from Puerto Rico as well. So, two, uh, you know, the Bermuda Triangle connects the two places I've 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 lived, and. I grew up reading about Area 51, always wondered what there was there. I grew up reading about, right, the missing flights from the Bermuda Triangle, Roswell, all these different stories of it. And I've kind of seen a shift in the perspective that, at least in my circles, more of the conspiratorial crowd. And it seems like, and this is this is going to get weird. All right. So a lot of people don't even believe in space, Jonas. OK, so you have the crowd that believes that aliens are ETs from other other planets, other galaxies, whatever. You have the other group that believes that they're interdimensional or intertempestrial, I believe is what they call where they're from a different time. Right. So they're time travelers. You have that crowd as well. And I've kind of noticed noticed a shift as far as. A lot of people think that the CE5 stuff and the, these Greers and uh, the other guy, the whistleblower that has to always get permission to talk about the UFO whistleblowing. He's got to get it approved for whatever reason. You know, I mean, never made any sense. Grush, whatever his name is. A lot of people believe that the aliens are a psyop, that they're that they're going to it's it's a Trojan horse that it's going to usher in something else, martial law or something. Me personally, I believe uh, more of the interdimensional aspect. I believe that there, that if God, this Godhead, uh, this center point created us, we'd be pretty ignorant to believe that we're the only things that exist. Uh, given that we can only see 0.003 or 5 of the light spectrum, right? Uh, there's a lot of things going on around us that we can't observe. And we have things like the observer effect. That is a real thing. The double slit experiment that we don't understand. And if you figure it out, you get a Nobel Peace Prize. If that's worth anything, you probably sell it or do something with it. But point being that reality, in my opinion, is a lot more malleable. So I do believe that these things, they, there could be entities from other, which ancient scriptures talk about this, right? The jinn. They exist, I believe, in a 90 degree angle to our reality, and they're able to bleed in. Maybe there is places around the world, right? The 12 vial vortices where the veil is thinner and they can see they could come through. You have occultists like Jack Parsons, Aleister Crowley, guys like this doing rituals to what they said, let these extraterrestrial entities in. So then they kind of take on a sort of angels and demons sort of mask i guess elemental sort of thing so i'm in the camp of of i think that outer space is not what they've told us now, i'm not saying the world is flat i'm up for for i'm up for you know until i see it i can't tell you if it's round or flat whatever if it's a firmament who knows but i think that if anything they're interdimensional and i would put more money on and something that you're able to observe something I experienced I've I'd put my money on maybe they come from hollow earth right I do believe that the earth is hollow I've been to cave systems or right, where you're able to go in I have a friend of mine who lives in Vietnam and in Vietnam there's the I believe it's the Dung Gong cave or something like that where it's one of the largest underground ecosystems that goes on for miles there's only animals that exist in there found in there so if anything there might be a civilization existing underneath our feet now i mean they, they got it in movies like king kong versus godzilla that are super hollow earth you know you have the why can't you go to antarctica why can't you go to the north pole like what's going on are there entrances there who knows right and, uh, like i said there's so many questions of things that we don't understand that are that are real, right? That you can touch and feel, let alone, you know, what is reality? What is what is all this? You know, where do thoughts come from?
<laughs> are your thoughts your own thoughts, right? So if anything, I'd say aliens at the end of the day are interdimensional, right? And I think that these CE5 guys, it might be BS, but there's something to the act of prayer. There's something to the act of meditation about, again, about the manipulation of subtle energy that causes the change within reality. So you have manifestation, which I've experienced myself. That I, I do believe in that. If you put yourself in a certain train of thought, you will make, and it's not like you, you think of gold and gold will appear. No, no. You still got to put in the work. <laughs> you, know, you still got to put in the leg work to bring forth this change, but it's all mind over matter. So I, you know, that's my interpretation of manifestation where it's, it's, you know, it's not, you think about it and it comes to be, it's about training yourself to put yourself in a certain uh, state of mind to bring forth that change. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, there's one or two more uh, questions come to mind around the whole UFO topic, but, but now, now that we're on manifestation, what, 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 what exactly do, does that mean for, for Juan, for you? How do you, how do you practice that? I practice, this is not, this is not a secret. Uh, I, I consider myself a memetic magician and I practice me magic and I believe it's one of the most powerful forms of magic. I, I, I believe that the original magic squares have evolved into what is now the meme. Now a meme is right. Everybody makes memes. They're funny. Right. And it's a picture. You put letters on it, but there's, in my opinion, a much more occult aspect that goes behind that. Now, when you, um, <laughs> when you make hyper sigils, such as comic books, right. And you put yourself in the medium, Things happen, Jonas. I can't explain it, but things happen. And I've experienced things that no one else would believe. And I'm not going to reveal until the ritual is complete, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, things that have happened to me because, and I believe it's because of this particular, I, this particular thing that I've done. Uh, but yes, I do practice Wait, magic. For, for those who are listening, can you, can you kind of discuss what you just showed on camera? So I it's, have two, so far two, I'm working on the third one. I have a comic book called The Chosen One. And the first issue is The Chosen One versus The Saturnian Cube, which is the, what got me into conspiracies, this idea of, of, say, of Saturn worship and these cubes all around, you know, in, in, in pop culture, uh, at the site of 9-11, they got these huge black cubes. The Jewish people have the, you know, the, the, the black cube on their head. Mecca is a huge black cube, all, you know, this cube symbolism. And in the first issue, the Demiurge drops a piece of technology, which is a, a cube into my reality. And I'm able to pick it up. It's, it's a Braxis prime. So it's, a, you know, a, a, a different, uh, Am, instead of Amazon prime, a Braxis prime is, is the one that they ha we have in this universe. And, I mess with the cube and whenever I do a swap cast with like another podcaster, they acquire special powers too. And then in the second issue, there is a secret society of, of the pod gods, which I hint at there being a secret society of podcasters. But while writing this and having people interact with it, I feel that when you, not just this, but even the podcast or the YouTube channel or whatever it is, when you're putting out art, uh, right. Life imitates art or art imitates life. And I believe that people interacting with that charges that. So when that's what I mean by meme, because meme is the smallest piece of information, but memes create culture. So the concept of language being a virus, how William Burroughs has talked about an extraterrestrial virus. When you spread a meme, you're infecting other people to create culture. Right. That's the whole idea of it. So it spreads like a virus. And I've had people interact with my work and I feel like it's charged my life. And I've had some, some wild, wild synchronicities that, that I tell people about. And, and I've, it's gotten to the point where whenever I do have a crazy synchronicity, like, like, damn, that was, that was wild. Like the other day, share, I share one with us. All right. So the other day I went to the DMV 
and I had to do some, I went downtown for some, some errands. I went downtown and let me find the screenshot. Cause I posted it on my Instagram and it was, so welcome to your business tax visit at, at downtown office. Your ticket number is 1313. Please be seated and listen for your number to be announced. And as soon as I got there, your ticket number 1313 is now being called at window 13. And as soon as I got up to go to the window, I was laughing like a madman. So I'm sure people were looking at me like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? But I just experienced a synchronicity of what are the chances that my ticket number is 13 and then I get to window 13, right? So the way I see and interpret synchronicities is they're cookie crumbs of reality. And, uh, and mm. I know that I'm on the right timeline, on the right reality, if you will. And I know that all the, deci- the decisions I've made up until this point are correct. And life, reality, God, consciousness, whatever it is, has a, you can, again, like Carl, you, you can interpret synchronicities for what they are, or they can have a deeper significance towards you, right? You can just let them be like, oh, well, that's just a coincidence. Well, I'm pretty sure, you know, you're going to let coincidence rule your life until you call it, you know, the car young quote, but yeah, these are the kind of things I experienced. And I've had some, again, some weirder ones and, and, and some that I've kept uh, behind closed doors until further notice. Cause they're just, they're just weird, man. And I, and it's just a <laughs> funny way to, you know, to go about it. So yeah, I think that putting out these memes, putting out the, the, the art that's why I always tell people whenever they want to start a show or do something, have fun, man. First, have fun. Let it be a passion project first and the rest will come. Because if you're trying to look at this from a business perspective, starting out, you're not going to do well. And it's not going to go well for you because you're not going to see the results that you want at first. The idea of a mimetic magician, Juan, that is dope. I've never heard that that phrase before. So this idea is essentially using art ideas memes to as a way to manifest or somehow influence your experience of life is is, am i understanding that correctly yep for whatever alchemical and alchemical means you know like i said there's different ways to skin the cat there's different ways to achieve the magnum opus and like i said i don't i don't know what my magnum opus is is it financial security? Is it uh, knowledge? Is it gnosis? Is it whatever? I don't. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that part out. But once I do, maybe I'll be able to make it happen, right? And I think I've made it this far and gotten this far uh, through the use of this technique. And uh, like I said, I've experienced results, and I think it, I think it works. <laughs> uh, I I I want to say I know it works, but uh, until proof, you know, I can't give you a hundred percent like, yeah, it does. Cause just sometimes I think that reality, it came up with a, with a, with an idea recently where I were talking about consciousness and what is it? Is it, is it an entity? Is it God? Is it something? And I believe that time itself could be a sort of living entity organism. And I think that it, it breathes, right? And I think that similar to how the emanationists believe that we're experiencing an emanation of, of the source of the one, we're not experiencing the source itself. I believe that time, right? The reason that we see these ebbs and flows is because it's, you know, it's a breathing. It's, it comes in waves. You know, you have lulls. How in life you have lulls, you have the, uh, you have the peaks, which are super awesome. And then you have the, the lows, which suck. And guess what? You, there's always a grind to the top, to the top, to the top. And I always feel that if you've ever traded stocks or crypto or something where, you know, you have the ceiling, you have the resistance. And usually when something is able to break a resistance, right, that price of whatever thousand, you know, you know, everyone's got their sell orders at that one at that one price. But once it breaks through that, it shoots way up until it finds a new floor. Right. And it will go up and down, up and down. And I look at reality always like that podcast the 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 whatever the youtube channel whatever it's like damn i've been stuck on x amount of subscribers right for so long but then once you break that floor 
it just keeps going until it finds an, a you know new resistance. So if you look at time like that, as this organism, this entity that breathes, ebbs and flows, and sometimes conforms to whatever you're experiencing, and that's why we experience synchronicities. Like, well, if the if the shoe fits, put it there. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then that's so inter- that's that's so interesting. I mean, like this idea of like a cyclical or kind of ebb and flow nature to to time that really resonates with, with me and my experience as well it, on a, on a personal individual level, like my own process of growth and, and kind of evolution or actualization. And then as well on a, on a human collective level, right? How does that idea pertain to the, the state of affairs in on, on planet earth right now? Because it seems to me, I wonder if you agree, it seems to me like humanity as a collective right now is right on the verge of some kind of inflection point or tipping point where we're hitting some kind of resistance point and needing to break through into a new paradigm, a new way of, of evolving a kind of a great awakening, a spiritual evolution or, or, or something. I don't know. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? For as much as I'd like to believe that a lot of people are waking up, I've experienced more encounters with people who aren't awake. And I don't like that term awake and woke or whatever, uh, but people who haven't seen through the, through the BS, but all the stuff that we've ever experienced, a lot of things that we've experienced, it goes back to the, to what I call, you know, I've called them the sorcerers of the subconscious. I'm not the only one doing mimetic magic. I believe that these mimetic magicians you know, you have the cinemagicians that use movies, which uh, is another form of art to influence societies. And I always question, like, why were so many movies and why was the what I call the Hollywood pantheon born through the Great Depression? All these all the greatest movies were, were done through the Great Depression. I go, well, wasn't it really bad during that time? Like, wasn't there like people, uh, you know, doing things to, to get out of it and all this stuff and. It was a really bad time, but it was because these movies were a form of escape for people because their realities were so bad. They would go to the movie theater and live through these characters in these movies. So you had King Kong, you had uh, Dracula, you had White Zombie, you had all the archetypes, uh, the werewolves, all these movies come out during the Great Depression. I go, what the heck? That doesn't make any sense to me. Where they, where were they getting the movie, uh, the, the money from? They were getting it from. And that's why I think during 2020... Movie theaters also didn't go out of business because they're a vital uh, aspect of reality to condition the masses. And a lot of the things that are going on nowadays have already happened in a lot of movies. <laughs> you know, a lot of the things that we talk about today have. So with that being said, does life imitate art or is it the other way around? So. I'm not saying that they're going to bring forth the apocalypse or Ragnarok or something through the use of movies, but let's step a little bit further. Just how, again, the shaman class, the cartographer as magician, the architect as magician, the you know XYZ as magician, do, are, are these directors tapped in to something, right? This, this current, or does it naturally come out? Does it naturally ooze out as you're writing these stories? Right. So the way I see it is I feel like we've always been at this resistance point of like, Mm. oh, well, the next level. Well, it feels like every century or whoever, every hundred years, every 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 few years, you know, peoples have had their ends of the world. You know, I'm sure. We had just had 9-11 pass. I'm sure that on 9-11, I was in second grade. A lot of people thought the world was ending then. You know, in the year 2000, Y2K, a lot of people thought the world was going to end then. A lot of people thought the world was going to end in 2012. A lot of people thought the world was going to end in 2020. Recently, the eclipse, a lot of people thought the world was going to end then. So it feels like it's always, but it's, it's like, you know, this fear porn. And I think that the internet, through the use of memes, again, this information is to blame for a lot of that too. Because these news outlets will paint 
a picture for you of like, hey, the world ending, it's all on fire. Go outside, dude. Take some mushrooms <laughs> and go touch grass. Because it's not like that outside. But once you get sucked into these reality tunnels, it can feel that way. But I don't know, man. I, I've I've always thought about that. I feel I, I want to say that people are more open to ideas and they're seeing the contradictions when it comes to the news outlets and all these things going on and these stories that were conspiracy at first and then they get exposed. Maybe there are more people who are awakened and by a way, you know, the apocalypse just means the unveiling. Are we close to an apocalypse? I don't know, maybe. But there sure are a lot of people still stuck in the left right paradigm, the red blue, the sports identities. You know, I saw a video the you know a couple of days ago, people fighting over their football teams. What? You know, like, who cares? You know, there's, we have to understand consciousness. What are you doing arguing about this football team that doesn't care about you in any form or fashion? So as much as I'd like to think that there there is this, we're at the point of, oh, we're about to break through. I see stuff like that. And I'm just like, like these guys add another 100,000, 200,000 people just like that. And I can only tell you from my perspective, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my reality tunnel with my things. And I know a whole lot of people who are open-minded. But I have I have I have clips with millions of views on them. And the comments say otherwise. <laughs> you know, there's right. people still in Plato's cave, man. And they're still looking For at sure. those shadows on the walls going, "That no, that's the truth. Get away get away from me." For sure. For sure. For sure. Well, you know, this idea of, of resistance, I, I think that sometimes resistance is the greatest right before that point of breakthrough, right? And it's like the closer you get to kind of a breakthrough or unveiling, the more the friction increases. And I, I, I want to come back to, to the topic of of UFOs just for a second, because no matter what anyone believes about this topic, it's on, it's there's no doubt that just confronting this mystery or or entertaining this mystery somehow forces the mind to open up be, beyond just the red blue left right me versus you right and and consider a bigger picture right a, a, a greater reality I'm curious your thoughts because you mentioned some of the whistleblowers who have been coming forward, David Grush just being one of them, but there's a number a number of people who have come forward and, and put forth some pretty explosive claims, namely that the U.S. government and other world governments are currently in possession of highly anomalous materials all the way up through fully intact craft of non-human origin is – the actual terminology that has been used by some of these high ranking government officials in the congressional us congressional testimonies that happened in just recently in july of of 2023 right very much in the vein of 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 roswell and the whole roswell episode and crash all the way back in the 1940s is it your belief that the us government and or world governments are currently in possession of recovered materials of non-human origin where's the proof <laughs> you know like when, whenever i see a whistleblower I, okay okay um show me a video show me a picture it's always a story and it is could there be a grand conspiracy to withhold this this technology from the you know the rest of the world I think it it'd be uh, it's a pretty big conspiracy. I think it would take a lot of moving players to keep it under wraps. But then, and from texts that I've read myself, that are that you know from the eighteen hundreds, seventeen hundreds, you know of of people from the church uh, talking about UFO craft and and what you know what one guy calls homunculus coming out of the craft, you know, little men coming out of the craft and the people getting the little men and presenting it to him and go, Hey, what do we do? Do we kill them? Or what do we do with these 
things, right? That's weird. You know, th there wasn't a, a, a Area 51 back then. And here this story is written down before anyone would benefit from said story. If you get what I'm saying, you know, this whole crowd of like, oh, aliens are, are, are fake and gay, you know, as, as I like to say. But all this other stuff, it's like there's so many stories throughout history that that resonate or resemble what's being described it's like are they you know they could be something i but whenever i question about does the government have the craft you have the other guy what's the guy with the the other famous guy i forget his name he's been on rogan a bunch that he said elizondo or not elizondo the other guy that jeremy jeremy corbell or jock valet or not jock valet either there's other the other guy that Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar. That guy's story. You know, not until they come out with. I'm probably not going to believe the, the alien stuff until, you know, for 100. percent Any of these whistleblowers, I'm not going to believe them until they come out with you know physical proof. But nowadays, even if I think even I think that we're at the point that even if we had the physical proof, people wouldn't believe it then, dude. I think that's where we're at now. And I had an astrologer one time tell me that it's got something to do with Saturn coming into some junction or something or other. And that Saturn, right, rules over illusions and, and reality, right? The demiurge Saturn and that people won't believe their eyes. And I think that we've gotten to that point in society where you quite literally can't believe your eyes with the, the AI and how advanced it. I'm telling you that I ha we have the technology to extract text from these old books and then take that and put into another AI and translate it. Dude, there's people coming up with videos that look real. So what a better time to come out with the proof than today. And I, and I think if it comes out today, people aren't going to believe it because hey, it's a deep fake. So what's, what's the, what's the end goal? I don't know. I don't know what the end goal is with it, but a lot of people seem to believe that it's a sort of way for them to usher in a new world order or, you know, Project Blue Beam or blah, blah, blah to control the masses with religion. And they can't come out with the information because it's going to be an ontological shock to everybody. Like, you know, in the movie Prometheus, come to find out we were genetically engineered uh, beings by the who? The engineers. Well, who the hell are they? Well, they come from over there and then they go there and you see these huge giants, right? <laughs> it's been in movies time and time again. And not until I see it, man, am I going to be like, all right, well, they're here. You know, here they are at the the lawn of the, of the White House or somewhere. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that, that's where I said, do they, do I believe they have some sort of technology that, uh, that they need to protect and what a better way to Let, let's step away from like et or or extraterrestrials we understand it and you know one of my favorite conspiracies is the conspiracy of the war in baghdad and the fact that saddam hussein's palace was on the 33rd parallel like 33 33 33 33 he believed he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. He was collecting all these artifacts and that the right that around that area in the Middle East was where the Tower of Babel was. Well, what if the Tower of Babel was, you know, a stargate of some sorts? And that plays into like the whole thing with World War II. Did we go stop them because they had some sort of technology that they weren't supposed to have? We know that they were obsessed with the occult. Right. Talking about the Nazis. They were obsessed with the occult. They were looking for the Holy Grail. They had whole teams. Right? It's like Indiana Jones. Whoa. Except that's what the history books say now. How accurate are the history books? I don't know. But to think that maybe the U.S. went over there to acquire weapons of mass destruction. Some sort of portaling technology or something, you know, a Tower of Babel sort of thing where I believe could have been a stargate of some sort. And then you look at what CERN is doing. What the hell are they doing? I think they're trying to do the same thing that we've been talking about this entire time. I think they're trying to figure out what the beginning is, right? Clashing 
particles together to experience another dimension. Right? Well, what the hell is the Higgs boson? Well, the Higgs boson weighs differently in different dimensions that it's, it comes from. So once you tap into it and you're able to measure the mass of that Higgs boson, it, you know, if it measures differently than the one in our dimension, you've just tapped into something else. And the weird occult stuff that they got there, just pay no mind to it. Statue of Shiva in the front doing the dance of destruction. That's got nothing to do with it. The movie Angels and Demons wasn't filmed there or anything like that, you know? So it's like how Manly P. Hall says the modern day alchemists, the only thing that's changed is that instead of them being in a cave, they have four walls and a white lab coat. And instead of the occult, they call it quantum physics or quantum whatever. And they're just messing with energies that they don't understand. And they just label it something else. It goes from UFO to UAP to whatever else you want to call it. At the end of the day, it's something that we don't understand. And maybe they know that maybe there is, you know, these black budget uh, projects a part of me says, oh, it's all money laundering or it's all this or it's all that. But like I said at the beginning, I don't understand these topics any more than I did when I first started. <laughs> and I got more questions than answers, man. Well, along those lines, one of the ultimate questions, Juan, do you, what do you think happens when we die? My dad recently, by recently, like two years ago now, uh, had a heart attack. He died four times. And me being me, when he came back, he was able to come back. He was dead for 45 minutes. Coming in and out, right? Wow. When, he, when he came back, he was off the drugs and off the stuff that they had him. I drove him crazy. I asked him, I said, so... Uh, what was it like? You know, I've never met anybody who's, you know, I can't talk to anybody who's died because they died, but you were, you were gone 45 minutes. You know, you were in and out a couple of times, four times. They were able to bring him back every time. What was it like? What'd you see? Did you see your life flash before your eyes? Like what, what, you know, near death experience of what, what the hell was it? He said, no, doesn't remember anything. He just remembers going to the hospital and then remembers waking back up. So a part of me is like, when you die, is there nothingness and you don't remember being nothing and nothing is nothing and that's it? Or is it how some people have talked about, you know, having near death experiences where they see their, you know, the whole DMT thing. Uh, you know, right the, at the point where you're going to die. I've been close. I've been an hour away from the brink of death. I had when I was seven years old, my appendix ruptured. So I, I had appendicitis and my appendix actually ruptured. Right. So I was experiencing the symptoms for so long. that my So I was actually leaking essentially fecal matter into my blood system. You go septic and you, and you die. I was an hour away from dying. So if, if my family would have waited an hour, I would have been gone but even as a child i mean i don't remember anything other than the pain and for those that have ever experienced appendicitis pain it's one of the worst pain that you could ever experience it's you know full body pain it's it's not like oh i got a stomach no no it's it's you can't i couldn't walk you know again i was seven years old but you couldn't i couldn't walk from the excruciating pain that's when they took me to the hospital and then they, they were able to open me up and and um, take it out of me. But even then, I don't remember having a near-death experience. So what do I speculate happens after you die? Maybe perhaps you're reincarnated or something. <laughs> you know, my, my, my son, I've always wondered who he was before he was my son. You know, because kids say some weird stuff. Right, and it's a, are they remembering something from another life that they previously lived? Or do souls jump from body to body? 
We have all these stories of kids remembering entire past lifetimes or having the same birthmarks as somebody else that's passed away or whatever it is, you know, just weird stuff like that. But I don't know, man. I think that once we're gone and the lights are off, whatever biological thing we are ceases to exist. And I think that once you lose, you know, consciousness as far as being awake, I think that the soul goes on. And um, I don't know if you experienced it then or not, to be honest with you. And that goes that goes against everything I grew up with. You know, thinking, being told that whenever we pass on, we're going to go into heaven, this other dimension and live there with God in a mansion of gold. And you're going to worship 24 seven. But again, experiences of life have uh, made me think otherwise, especially with my dad. So I don't know, man. I don't know what happens when we die, but. Hopefully I'm not reincarnated as a cricket or, or a tree or something. Or may, maybe. I think that'd be better. And to, live in, <laughs> and to live paying taxes and having to work a nine to five. Right. I'm, I'm wondering, so, someday your son is going to grow up and be watching and listening to all your, your podcasts and your interviews. What do you hope that he learns Oh, my little one, he, he's uh he's got an inquisitive mind. He asks a lot of questions, a lot of questions, a lot of questions. He's, he's definitely going to, he's, he's taken after me in that aspect, but Apple doesn't fall far. It doesn't. And I feel that <laughs> I'm going to pass on tradition. And by that, you know, present to them the, I got two sons present to them. The, you know, my other son is named Noah. Present to them the the stories, you know, of the, the Bible and and God and and when they're of age, if they want to explore, I'm going to respect that because I've been there. You know, what I'm saying I've been in those shoes of, don't do that. You know, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to believe. And I turned out okay. You know, I I turned out pretty good. Pretty, I, I did well, but some people don't, and I think that. If it comes to that with with them, I will respect it, and I'll give them you know the link to the podcast. And be like, hey, listen to your old man's podcast <laughs> where I've talked about all this stuff, and I've asked all the questions that you're thinking about and some, and whatever they come up with, you know, I'll respect it, and you know, but I'm gonna pass on the tradition, and when they're when they're men. They can come up with their own conclusions. I'm not going to force anything on them. Juan, I really uh, appreciate your time here today, man. Just one one last question for you. Are you hopeful for the future? Yeah, I am. I'm having fun. I'm the having a great future time. Future of, of, of Earth, of, of humankind? Yeah. I think that um, regardless of everything, if you just turn off, social media or or you know and even for for an example you you shape your own reality and by what i mean by that is if you go on to your twitter let's just use this as an, as an example and you filter out certain words you're not going to see a lot of the things that you're seeing and it's going to completely change your perspective on everything if you're heavily on social media if it was up to me i'd completely eliminate that right but given the circumstances i need to exist on social media to get the word out get the show out right but if i could have the least digital footprint that i could i probably would have done that from the beginning but i didn't know i was going to get this far but yeah i think that reality is going great aspects of society could use some tweaking right i mean i don't think we could ever live in a utopia because i think even that would be chaotic right everything if everything was perfect in, in in terms of the world and again, how I mentioned earlier, I think time flows. You got ups and downs. Same goes with society. Same goes with nations. Same goes with everything. But I am hopeful, dude. And I think I always encourage people whenever they're, you know, they're listening to my show. Be good. Be good to one another. Love one another. Don't fight, man. There's no, there's no point. That's part of their plan. 
right? They want to keep you divided. But if we can all come together and go, you know what? Turn your turn towards the real enemy instead of fighting all within with each other, which is what's happening. We're not, you know, house divided cannot stand. So if we're able to come together and respectfully have conversations, right? Have debates, have con- whatever. And I think debating is, is dumb, but have conversations and understand each other better. And like how I mentioned earlier, we all have the same, you know, we ha- all have different pieces of the puzzle. We come together and build that puzzle. We might be able to help one another. But that's going to be one step at a time, in my opinion, and, and easier said than done. Because of, again, so many aspects of society and, and reality and everything else politically going on, right? But at the end of the day, I am hopeful. And, yeah, I encourage people to just take care of one another. right? Get to know your neighbors. Help them out. And, and just, just be a good person. Be the best person you can be. Be the best version of yourself that you can be. And once you're able to align yourself with that, let the rest happen. I'm a product of that, dude. Just go with the flow, man. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Don't look over to the other guy and be like, oh, it took him X amount of time. No, no, don't even worry about that. Stay in your lane and contribute as much positivity as you can to your community and then the rest will come. Love it. Love it. Well, it strikes me that you're contributing a lot of positivity, man, by, by sharing like the wisdom, so. sharing, sh- sharing the knowledge, really like discussing all the topics that you discuss from mysticism to Gnosticism to alchemy, esotericism, the occult consciousness, spirituality. I mean, I truly do believe that if there was a greater awareness of a lot of these different topics, which our ancestors knew a lot about, if there was a greater awareness of these topics and a greater connection to this exploration in the modern age, in the human collective, the world would look a lot different, you know? So I salute your efforts. I'm, I'm grateful for you, brother, and, and uh, Likewise, dude. keep doing the good work. Yeah, keep up the great work. And same to you, Jonas. Keep up the great work. Yeah, you've you've always been an uh, inspiration for me. That's why I'd reach out the, in the first place. And I know we've kept in touch, you know, throughout the years. And hopefully we'll keep in touch for the next X amount of years, man. You're my fr- I consider you a friend. So Likewise. thanks for having me on, dude. I enjoyed this. Great conversation. And I wish you all the best, dude. Absolutely. Can you just let the, the listeners know where they can find you? I'll include the links in the description. I have a link tree. I can send you that. My website's tjojp.com. That's the one-on-one podcast, uh, but just abbreviated tjojp.com. And that'll take you to all my links. I got a Patreon. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Rumble. I'm on Twitch. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, all, all the socials. You'll find me. Uh, just look for, you know, Google one-on-one podcast. I'll come up. I'm on all major podcast platforms. I'm everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. Jonas, I'll send you my links. And yeah, people can find me on there and find my comic books. I also publish uh, these. They're like zines, but I call them journals. The Occultist Monday, which is about just different esoteric topics. And my latest one is uh, the Occultist Monday Homunculus Edition. It's uh, my precursor, my homunculus to my homunculus book that is eventually going to come out whenever, whenever it happens. But 88 pages all about the alchemical homunculus. You can find that on my website as well. And it's got different, you know, it's got one of a kind art that I got made uh, just about the homunculus. So if you enjoy that sort of stuff, more esoteric knowledge, you can check that out. And yeah, dude, appreciate you having me. Awesome. Juan, thanks, brother. Thank you.